poor health has actually become the normal all around us. It's one of those things where you become blind to it. The predominant messaging around healthy food has been the food pyramid. The food pyramid should essentially be flipped upside down. We got it so wrong that it almost has to be intentional. When you really isolate out red meat, you cannot find a relationship with heart disease or cancer or any of these ill health effects. Everyone has to realize they have the power within themselves to keep themselves healthy and to not need me as a heart surgeon. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Dr. Ovedia here with me. Uh, I thought a great place to start a conversation was uh, there's a lot of people on Twitter. They share all kinds of crazy uh, conspiracy theories or, or medical advice or whatever. They're usually not a doctor. So uh, one, you got going for, you are a doctor. Uh, you've done over 3,000 heart surgeries. Uh, but also what I find fascinating is you are somebody who uh, has taken the things that you're talking about on the internet and put into practice in your own life. You lost over 100 pounds yourself. And so there's two unique aspects. You're a doctor. You actually have seen some of this stuff in practice yourself. Why talk about it on the internet? Like what like what has got you so excited and so amped up about kind of sharing this stuff with uh, with the audience that you've built on the internet? Yeah, it really comes down to, you know, I, my purpose as a doctor is to help people. Mm -hmm. And that should be any way that I could help them. So, you know, for the first part of my career, the way I helped people was by doing heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And I still continue to do that. But what I've re come to realize through my personal journey, through losing 100 pounds, through addressing how unhealthy I was as a doctor, was that I can help even more people now by not needing the heart surgery, mm -hmm. by educating them, teaching them how to be healthy, how they can go down the same path I went down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's sort of the higher purpose, I think. Uh, that's the calling now. So I continue to be a heart surgeon. I continue to help people who need that. Yep. But I would much rather people not need the heart surgery. I'd much rather they stay off my operating table ultimately. So I've seen you talk about you were successful professionally, but you were unsuccessful from a personal health standpoint. Uh, let's talk first about the professional career of a heart surgeon. How long does a heart surgery take? And like, what exactly happens? Because the patient gets knocked out, right? Uh, most people haven't been in the room. Like when you say heart surgery, talk us through kind of at a high level, like what is that process like? Sure thing. So, you know, the most common type of heart surgery we do, it's called coronary artery bypass grafting, cabbage mm -hmm. as it's uh known. And that is for people who have developed blockages in the arteries of their heart. And we need to basically reroute the blood. We need to get better blood flow going. So that surgery typically is going to take anywhere from about four to six hours wow. um, from the patient's standpoint. Um, a lot of that is kind of prepping and ending, you know, so my actual time in there, you know, when I'm really in there with my hands in someone's chest is in the three to four hour range, typically, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what we're doing. And when you are rerouting it, uh, I'm going to be the educated idiot here for sure. Uh, when I think of a blockage in an artery, it's literally something has built up and is blocking the clean flow of the blood. Uh, are you simply trying to remove the blockage so that then they can continue to use the same artery? Or are you almost building like an artificial artery around the blockage? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So what I do is lay new pipe, essentially. Okay. You can think of it. Um, in some situations, we can open up the pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what stents are. Um, so one of the kind of misconceptions, you know, everything gets lumped into heart surgery, uh, but stents are typically put in in a, what's called a catheterization lab mm -hmm. by a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. And in situations where that's not applicable, mm -hmm. the heart surgeon mm -hmm. then does bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. And this is really, as we said, laying new pipe. Uh, so we don't typically unblock the blockages that are there. Mm -hmm. We give a new route for the blood to go around the blockage. Got it. And so this is uh, what I would consider the uh, kind of defensive mechanism. If you're an unhealthy person uh, and you've like screwed up for a long time, right? I'm assuming they get to you and yep. you're like, okay, get on the operating table and I will like cut open your chest and literally fix the problem. But what I find fascinating is that when you were talking about being an unsuccessful, healthy person, uh, you actually spend a lot of your time being like, never get to me. Like there's a way to play offense. And as I kind of went down this rabbit hole, understanding kind of your journey and, and what you had done, 
it really just comes down to the food you eat. It seems like like that was a huge piece. I didn't really see you talk about uh, a lot of the other kind of more exotic things. It was just like eat in a different way and that will do a very big percentage of the work to keep you off of the operating table. Is that like a, a fair way to evaluate kind of the conclusion you've come to there? Yeah, it really is. And it's not only applicable to, you know, what I do, heart surgery. Mm -hmm. Really, when you look at all of our problems around health these days, most of them come from us making ourselves unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, we have gotten into a situation um, where, first of all, we've normalized being unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the statistics are just truly frightening. Uh, the one that probably I cite most often is that 88%, so almost 9 out of 10 adults in the United States today are not healthy. Uh, when we look at, you know, the definition, what we call metabolic health, mm -hmm. five basic criteria of health, and nine out of 10 adults cannot meet that. Mm -hmm. We look at other statistics like 60% of the adults over 50 years of age in the U.S. are not only on one medication, they're on multiple prescription medications. So poor health has actually become the normal all around mm -hmm. us. And it's one of those things where you become blind to it. We don't even really expect to be healthy anymore. Mm -hmm. And we spend all of our efforts, all of our energy, trying to manage our illness instead of trying to remain healthy in the first place. And that's where I think we need to refocus our efforts, you know, talking about doctors, talking about the healthcare system in particular. And that's where each individual, everyone has to realize they have the power within themselves to keep themselves healthy and to not need me as a heart surgeon or not need the healthcare system in general. What's fascinating about what you're talking about here is there is one aspect which like I'll put into like the culture wars. This is people on Twitter going nuts when they see uh, the fat mannequin at the store and they're like, oh my God, we're normalizing unhealthy uh, kind of standards. There is what you're specifically talking about, which is more of like the pharmaceutical uh, approach of like, it probably hasn't always been the way that people lived where hit 50, here's six pills, and like, there you go, right? Obviously, some of these pills didn't even exist prior. Now they do. And so are we simply using the pharmaceuticals as uh, a Band-Aid on other problems? Uh, and then also, there's just like, is there a rise in the worsening of the way people feel, whether that's like depression and, and some of the mental uh, health stuff? Uh, is it just literally their blood pressure's going up and maybe they're not even actually taking medicine and, and so they end up just having kind of shorter life horizon? Like it feels all of this is the same thing, right? It, it's different ways to kind of break down the conversation or frankly argue on the internet. But really what we're getting back at is like, Americans don't live a very healthy lifestyle in general. And I think you're really highlighting a lot of it has to do with the food that we eat. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great way to think about it. You know, we if we start to think about this sort of uh, information environment around health mm -hmm. and we start to see that so much of this can be tracked back to the food that we eat. Um, we see the clear shifts over time that as more and more processed food mm -hmm. gets introduced into the environment, people become more unhealthy, populations become more unhealthy. And yet we, in a, for many reasons, won't address the food part of it. We say, well, we can take care of that with something else, whether it be pharmaceuticals, whether it be surgeries. Um, you know, the, the sort of view of the healthcare system um, is that, okay, we're going to deal with the problem, we're gonna manage the problem, but we're not really going to address why the problem occurred in the first mm -hmm. place. When you see the rise in processed foods, w what is driving that? Is that capitalism? Is that uh, the need and want to have better preservation uh, of, uh, of food? Is that uh, some altruistic view of like, let's feed the hungry? Like, well, like what is driving uh, such a rise in processed food? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, it probably started um, – Hunger, starvation, you know, was a problem historically. Mm -hmm. For much of our existence as human beings, when you go back through the ancestral record, um, it was a struggle to get enough food. Mm -hmm. So 
you could say that it probably started from that sort of altruistic uh, standpoint. And obviously, as the population grew and we got into, uh, you know, we got out of the nomadic life, um, it necessitated being able to have food available, being able to store food, and then, you know, being able to move food from place to place. Mm -hmm. Um, All of these things became necessary. But at some point, and I think this is fairly recently, we reached this sort of tipping point where now the problem wasn't starvation anymore. Food was abundant. Food was available. And now we've got the opposite problem where we're in an excess environment and our bodies haven't caught up with that on the evolutionary standpoint. Um, And, you know, so I think the original intent of sort of processed food was altruistic, was noble. We got to save people. You know, we got to be able to keep people alive. Uh, But we've now clearly reached a problem where the processed food is problematic is causing health problems, is having the opposite effects, and it's shortening people's lives. Uh, But now we're so entrenched in that way of thinking and that system uh, that, you know, it's hard to get out of it. Like most big institutions, you know, big food is an institution, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's an institution that has powerful um, effects, you know, across all aspects of society. And now we got to figure out how to undo this problem that we've created. There's a, uh, a rural uh, town in North Carolina. My wife and I were driving through uh, at one point and um, it's kind of one of these streets where uh, there's, I don't know, three, four, five stoplights, but it's a, a one way or a, a kind of straight shot that you can look down. And uh, for whatever reason, I said to her, oh my God, look at all the signs. And it was Wendy's, McDonald's, Bojangles, Chick-fil-A. It was just like all of it, right? Yep. And uh, it was almost like a, a shot you would see on uh, on the internet, right? That kind of goes viral. And people were like, wow, America is like so stupid. <laughs> um, and, and as we looked, what I think shocked me was in that small town, I don't know if you could have an average salary and eat healthy, right? Because everything that was thrown in your face was – cheap and unhealthy. And so how much of the like obesity epidemic or, or uh, kind of the rise in the unhealthy American is a socioeconomic and like a, a poverty problem or, or a, um, a money problem versus, no, people have the money to go and eat healthy. It's just they aren't educated or they're lazy and they, and they don't want to do the work to actually do that. Yeah. So I, I do think that both play into it. You know, okay. when you look at you know, why is processed food so inexpensive? Mm-hmm. Um, you start to look at government incentives around, you know, the crops that get mm-hmm. subsidized um, versus, uh, you know, why aren't those subsidies going to the, the ranchers who are raising, you know, cattle? Um, so you have to ask, why is that food the inexpensive food? Mm-hmm. I mean, the reality is it doesn't need to be that way. We could very easily shift what becomes the inexpensive food for people. And then there certainly is the um, educational piece of it. Uh, And quite frankly, we start to get into the miseducational piece of this because, you know, the predominant messaging around healthy food here in the United States for the past 50 years has been the food pyramid that, you know, grains Whole grains are the healthiest thing you should be eating and, uh, you know, cereals and wheat and all of this. That's insane. It is insane. That is literally insane. We have (laughs) more than enough evidence at this point to know that that shouldn't be the case. You know, the food pyramid should essentially be flipped upside down. Uh Um, So then you start asking those questions because it's like, okay, not only have we gotten this wrong, But we got it so wrong that it almost has to be intentional. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you can't you can't mess things up this badly without there being some intentionality to it. Okay, so this highlights uh, something that I've seen a number of my friends talk about, which um, put me they put me down a rabbit hole. I was like, oh, man, now I'm now I'm really messed up. (laughs) Uh, So I've had a bunch of friends who have gone to Europe over the last couple of years. And they're like, I went to Europe. I ate all the bread. I ate tons of pasta. I ate all of the gelato and, you know, whatever else uh, that they could eat. And they felt like they were eating disgustingly unhealthy. 
and they came back and they had lost weight. Yep. And of course the question is kind of like, well, were they walking more than normal? Like all, all that type of stuff. And, and uh, the people that I've seen talking about this and kind of been the most confused by it is like, they're like, no, I walk a lot at home and I looked at my, you know, data or whatever, steps are pretty much the same. It has to be the food. And so you're talking about just a food pyramid where grains are seen as like the most acceptable uh, uh, kind of food uh, group. But actually, it seems even the grains in America are different than maybe the grains that you would eat in Europe or, or elsewhere. So like maybe let's start there of just like before we flip the food pyramid, like what is the difference or at least your understanding of the difference between the types of grains or pastas or whatever that people are eating? Yeah, so, uh, and I've had the same experience myself, you know, going to France and eating the croissants and the baguettes and all of that. And yeah, you know, I, first of all, I didn't feel lousy like I do when I eat bread here. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I, you know, didn't gain any weight. And same thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty active here. I was pretty active there. Uh, it's interesting because we go back to the whole um, what led us to the food pyramid. Mm -hmm. And what led us to the food pyramid was basically, you know, in the 1950s, um, we had this rising epidemic of heart disease here in the United States. Um, a sitting president had a heart attack while in office, and this set off the alarm bells. Mm -hmm. And so we started asking what causes heart disease. And there were two prevailing theories at the time. Um, the one theory was that it was sugar, essentially, mm -hmm. processed carbohydrates that was leading to heart disease. And the other theory was that it was saturated fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. And the saturated fat diet, the saturated fat theory won out. Um, and we can get into all of that, but it won out. It became the prevailing theory. Was it a fair game? Did it win on, well, on merit or did it win because people were lobbying and playing kind of bullshit games? Yeah. In retrospect, I would say that it was not a fair game. Okay. So uh, one of the prominent scientists who promoted the theory of saturated fat causing heart disease, um, Ansel Keys, um, we now know basically made up a lot of his data. Wow. So the seminal... I shouldn't say made up, manipulated is probably a better okay. word. So the seminal study that he put forward early on was called the Six Country Study. Mm -hmm. And what he did in that study, what he published in that study, was looking at six countries and looking at their consumption of saturated fat mm -hmm. and looking at their incidence of heart disease. Mm -hmm. And it makes a nice straight line. Looks like a perfectly linear relationship. And so that got published and then everyone said, okay, it's obviously saturated fat. What we now know is that Ansel Keys actually studied 22 countries, and he handpicked the six countries that had this relationship. Um, and, you know, this was known in a lot of ways. You know, when you go back through the 1970s and the 1980s, for instance, people talk about the French paradox when it comes to heart disease. Because we knew that the French consumed more saturated fat than just about any other westernized country. You know, think Julia Child, think about the butter and everything. Mm -hmm. And yet they had the lowest incidence of heart disease of any of the westernized countries. So this was always thought about, well, the French must be, you know, they must exercise a lot or they, you know, whatever it is in their lifestyle that negates this effect of saturated fat. But the reality is, is that there never was an effect of saturated fat to start with. And the real problem with the saturated fat theory of heart disease, dietary saturated fat causing heart disease, is what it then led to. Because then we got down this whole pathway of, okay, we got to take all the saturated fat of our, out of our food supply. And if you're going to do that, that means you have to be processing the food and you have to be putting something else in. And what got put in? sugar, processed carbohydrates. And that, you know, we, in the 80s, it became all about the snack wells and everything was labeled low fat, low fat, low fat. Um, and if it's labeled low fat, it means it's been processed. It means sugar has been added to it in some form. And here we are 40, 50 years later, and we can see the devastating effects that this has had. So I'm not a genius by any means. But you just told me that there was two theories. One was saturated fat. One was processed sugar. And what I see you getting at here is that the saturated fat theory that was the prevailing theory, and that's why we went and made all these changes, we actually decreased saturated fat, but we increased processed sugar. And if I can read between the lines, maybe it was the, uh, the opposite, 
that it was the processed sugars that was creating all the heart disease. We actually made the problem worse rather than better. Yeah, and that's exactly what we see now. You know, as I said, here we are 50 years later, heart disease is still the number one killer in the United States and worldwide. So we haven't solved that problem. And even worse, what we see is obesity up, diabetes up, all of these other problems that come along with it, because it turns out that, you know, processed food doesn't just cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. um, if it makes you metabolically unhealthy, which it does, and we can get into what exactly that means. Um, it's not only going to increase your risk of heart disease, it's going to increase your risk of many types of cancer. It's going to increase Alzheimer's disease. It's going to increase many of the chronic diseases that are now plaguing our society. Mm -hmm. We can go down the list of the top 10 causes of death every year in the United States, and seven out of the 10 of them are directly attributable to the poor metabolic health that results from eating this processed food. So when you look at processed food, People will say it tastes great, right? Like, like that. That's the thing. no doubt. And uh, I always use the the one fact of uh, the McDonald's French fry yep. is like scientifically engineered to make you want to eat more of them. And when people start thinking, like, what do you mean? It's like, well, uh, it doesn't mean that they literally are in a lab, you know, with uh, uh, running experiments and all this stuff. Although there is uh, uh, evidence that suggests they maybe they were are. doing that, yep. right? But what it does mean is that they are trying to make it taste so good that every time you're, I'm hungry, you think, hey, I want to go get McDonald's, but they also want to do it in a way where they can produce it for next to nothing and there's profit margins and, and kind of all this. Now, as you said, uh, they actually are in the lab testing a lot of this stuff. And what I saw when you were talking about having lost 100 pounds was your previous diet was eat what I want when I want, which I think most Americans are like, that's what I do. You still today eat what you want when you want. It's just that you changed what you eat. And so I think the first kind of big like aha for a lot of people is just like you don't have to suffer in order to actually lose weight, right? You can eat whenever you want, as much as you want, like all this stuff. You just have to eat the right types of food, which I think is a unique message because what people are used to doing is getting bombarded with this fad diet or that fad diet or take this pill or do this thing or, you know, the, the seven-day water fast or, you know, whatever it is. That's not what you're saying at all. You're just saying like, hey, if you just eat healthy food rather than unhealthy food, like you're probably going to get much farther along than you would otherwise. Yeah, certainly true. And this was an aha moment for me, you know. So I wouldn't even really say, you know, that I was eating whatever I wanted whenever I wanted. You know, I had um, what most people would consider a healthy diet. Um, you know, I grew up in a household that we followed the food pyramid. Um, my older brother is a type 1 diabetic. We had no sugar in the house. Um, we drank our skim milk on our Wheaties and our Cheerios. And, uh, you know, I would say we had a healthier diet than most. Um, I was also very active. You know, that's the other thing that people say. Oh, well, people get fat because they're not active enough. I played sports year round. I rode my bike everywhere. I walked. You know, I grew up in a very suburban environment. And despite this, I became more and more unhealthy. And, you know, then I got to college and then I got to medical school. And so now I learned all the nutritional science, you know, all the stuff. Uh, and, you know, one of the unfortunate things about going through medical school is we don't cover a lot about nutrition. Uh, but what we do cover, um, I followed, you know. And then I tried all of those miserable things that people do to lose weight. You know, I counted my calories. I did the the points and the shakes and the, all of that stuff. And like most people, I had the experience that it would work for a little bit of time. I could stick with it. I had enough willpower. I'd lose some weight. And then you just can't stick with it anymore. And you end up gaining back the weight and more. Mm -hmm. So the big aha moment for me, the big change for me was exactly that. I heard a talk at a medical conference by a journalist by the name of Gary Taubes. And uh, Gary, at the time, had just written his book, The Case Against Sugar. Prior to that, he had written uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, and Why We Get Fat. And Gary came at this problem as an investigative journalist. He started investigating the food, the diet industry. And 
you know, he went back through a lot of the science. He has a science background as well as his journalism background. And he saw that it's not about the amount of food that we eat. It's not calories in, calories out, as we had all heard our whole life. But the types of food that you eat have a unique influence on your metabolism and on how hungry you are. So it turns out when you eat good food, when you eat whole real food, I always explain it as the things that grow in the ground and the things that eat the things that grow in the ground. And when you stick to eating these foods, your body can tell you, you've gotten enough. You're not hungry. You don't need to be hungry all the time. And so, as you said, I now eat what I want when I want, mm -hmm. but what I want is good, nutritious, whole, real food. And when I want it is a lot less often because I'm not hungry all the time, mm -hmm. because I don't have these processed foods that are hijacking my hunger mechanisms. So to get back to what you were saying, you know, are there people in the lab sitting there trying to figure out what makes me, what makes me more hungry, what makes you more hungry? Yes, there are. There are food scientists who have been hired by the food industry to specifically figure out how do we get people to buy more food? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, that's the goal of the food industry. They're a business like any other business, and they want you as hungry as possible. They want you buying their food that has the big profit margin in it. And this is now the environment we're in. If you think about, you know, you walk into your standard supermarket these days, 90% of what's in there is processed food. Mm -hmm. um, and it is specifically engineered to make you more hungry. The unfortunate side effect is that it also makes us less healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're now in this situation where, I, you know, where we're kind of stuck in this environment where almost everything around us, yes, we have lots of food around us, but it's not supporting our health. And it's keeping us more hungry and making us more unhealthy when we eat it. It's wild to think that uh, the brands and the companies that we've entrusted with uh, ensuring that we're not hungry are actually helping to make us more unhealthy and, and ultimately kill us, right? Um, and I had a Texas Slim, a, a Texas cattle rancher, yep. uh, on uh, on the show, and we were talking. And one of the things he said is when you go into the grocery store, stay, on, stay against the walls, yep. right? Don't, don't go in the middle. He's like, that's cartoon land. It's just there's bright colors, and they got all the characters and like the more that you see that stuff the more they're trying to get you to buy something and, and distract you from the fact that it's probably not nutrient dense and so when you go to the grocery store like what do you do H how do you go through the grocery store like what do you buy for you and your family to eat on a on a daily or weekly basis oh. is it okay x the new race car maybe but actually no OKX is one of the world's leading crypto trading apps. OK, X. Yeah, so it's it's mostly that. And, uh, you know, Slim and I are friends and, and we talk and, um, you know, we share those ideas. So my trips to the grocery store um, are around the outside of the store. You know, you walk in, you have your produce section, mm -hmm. um, you have your meat section, your seafood, your dairy, mm -hmm. and you're out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a quick trip. Um, it really is a lot less stressful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I try to explain to people these days, and it, it, they look at me so strangely, it's such a strange concept that I think a lot less about food these days. Mm -hmm. um, I don't spend all my time, you know, what am I going to be eating? What am I preparing? You know, mm -hmm. it, it becomes very easy to come home. Mm -hmm. You have something in the fridge or the freezer. You can prepare most of these foods pretty simply. You know, you take a steak, you throw it on the grill, four or five minutes each side. You're eating in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. There's no cleanup. There's no mess. You're done. Um, and... Uh, and you only have to do that once or twice a day again because mm -hmm. you're not that hungry. You're mm -hmm. eating the food that is, um, you know, providing the nutrients that your body needs. How many times a day do you eat? Uh, most days it's one. Sometimes it's two. Okay. And uh, are there certain hours a day that you eat or certain hours of day that you avoid eating? Uh, you know – I don't do this intentionally anymore. Um, the way my schedule works out, I tend to eat later in the day. You know, I'm a 
skip breakfast, um, you know, work through the day. And then when I get kind of done and uh, home, you know, I'll typically eat late afternoon to evening. Um, while I was trying to get healthy, you know, the um, intermittent fasting, as it's usually referred to, uh, was more of an intentional effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, after you do it for a while, it just becomes natural. Again, mm -hmm. you know, when we look back through our uh, history, if you think about your grandparents or great grandparents, they weren't eating six times a day like we do today. Um, they typically ate once or twice a day. You know, uh, when you look at the sort of ranchers, the farmer lifestyle, you know, you'd have a big breakfast before you head out into the fields and then you come home and, you know, you have your late afternoon or early dinner uh, and that's when you ate. Mm -hmm. um, again, this whole messaging around eating so often, mm -hmm. it all comes from the food industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day food industry. Um, there's no science that shows this. Um, the fact that you need to eat every, you know, three hours, every four hours to fuel your day. Again, this is all from the food industry. Uh, when you really look at it, you know, we don't need to eat nearly as often as we do. So there's really two things that ultimately are causing our health problems around food. It's what we're eating and it's how often we are eating it. So I've heard the uh, intermittent f uh, fasting, which uh, um, I tend to – I'm not a, a strict about it. I'm not like uh, religious about it. But uh, I definitely try to eat when I'm hungry and that tends to be mid to late afternoon. Uh, and what I notice now is if I eat in the mornings, uh, I'm like a little bit mentally groggy and just – it's like, okay, I, I actually like better to eat then. Um and the idea that I heard that made a lot of sense was uh, your body needs time to relax, right? And so if you're constantly giving it food, it's constantly working. And by only eating once or twice a day and kind of eating in these windows, uh, it allows your body to kind of cleanse itself and, and relax, and, and that's a better way. Now, I always like to flip around the other side of the table and say, well, what's the argument I've heard for eating all day long, right, that uh, uh, at least seems to make common sense to the average person, which is if you want to have a faster metabolism, then eat very small portions lots of times a day, and that will keep your metabolism going. I don't know if that's true. It's not. It's okay. not true. Okay. So is that like a food industry type thing of like this obsession with uh, uh, putting food in your body ends up igniting metabolism or, or what is the relationship there based on how you understand it? Yeah. So again, this goes back to the uh, whole concept around calories in, calories out. So, you know, one of the, again, theories as to why we have gotten so obese, why we, you know, have these uh, health problems is just because we're taking in too much food. We're taking in more calories than we burn. And there's this other um, kind of misconception, I guess, that probably goes along with it, that if you uh, all of a sudden stop eating, you know, uh, your metabolism slows down and you're going to burn less calories. And again, neither of these have really uh, uh, have any, you know, good scientific data behind them. Um, the problem with the calories in, calories out model is that we really can't assess either side of that equation very well. Okay. So when you have people try and guess, try and track how many calories they take in, they're widely inaccurate, um, you know, and it, there's many different reasons, you know, the amount of food, you know, no one's sitting there really weighing their food scientifically every day. Uh, and even, you know, if you look at packaged food um, and it says it has this number of calories in it, again, science shows that that can be off by 20, 25, 30 percent, um, even if it has the label on it. So we have we're very bad at judging at measuring how many calories we take in. I never thought of the calories being off, but I've always thought that the nutrition labels were full of shit. I'm like, somebody's sitting here, like, what's the difference between 7% or 8% yep. of, you know, uh, total carbohydrates? Like, exactly. Literally, somebody is just guessing. Um, you know, it. a lot of it, again, is why is the information that's on there even on there? I mean, you know, there could be lots of different things that are on food labels and, you know, they've picked certain things to be on there. Uh, but, you know, if, again, if you're well-intentioned, 
end and you say, okay, I'm going to count my calories and you try and count your calories, you're not going to be able to count them accurately. And then you have no idea how many calories you're b- burning outside of a laboratory environment. It, it is actually exceedingly difficult to accurately measure how many calories someone burns. And we have all these sort of equations that have been developed over the years to try and estimate this. Um, but again, it, it ends up being widely inaccurate. So what you're really saying is in order to do calories in, calories out, you'd almost have to be operating in such a uh, perceived like caloric deficit to ensure for the margin of error that like you would eat a thousand calories and burn 4,000. And then you could be like, yes, I'm for sure, you know, burning more than I'm eating, but that's nearly impossible for the average person. Right. And then when you try and do that, you know, you can't sustain that over the long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, again, the sort of starvation reflex, let's call it, you know, our bodies uh, aren't going to let us starve. Mm -hmm. So it's true that if you severely cut your calories um, and you're in a severe caloric deficit, your body's then going to ramp down your metabolism. So now you're not burning as much calories anymore. Um, And this is where the calorie in, calorie in, out model as a basis for weight loss really starts to break down. Um, Because, you know, you can actually flip it the other way. There are foods that are going to cause you to burn more calories. Protein, for instance, it takes more body, it takes more energy for your body to break down and process proteins than the other macros. So if you eat a lot of protein, your metabolism is actually going to go up. Um, And so they have done studies They're called protein overfeeding studies, where they give people just a ton of protein to eat. And those people don't get fat, you know, because their body is going to basically, you know, ramp up their metabolism uh, to uh, meet, you know, to break down that protein. Um, So, you know, calories in, calories out uh, becomes completely useless, essentially, when you're trying to get healthy when you're trying to lose weight. Um, But yet it's the message that continues to get pushed. Um, And again, you look at who is pushing that. It's the food industry. Because if you're the food industry and you want to distract from the fact that most of the food that you are making is such poor quality and is damaging people's health, what you do is you say, well, it doesn't matter the type of food that you're eating, it's just calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. So we can give you 500 calories of junk food, Mm -hmm. or we can give you 500 calories of nutritious whole real food, and there's no difference between those two. And this ends up, you know, feeding the narrative and supporting what you as the food industry are trying to do, which is just sell more of your food. Yeah, I I forget, I can't remember if it was Andrew Huberman, David Sinclair, somebody kind of in in that uh, uh, general scientific community that looks at nutrition, longevity. uh, They were talking about a study, I think it was done with either mice or or rats, uh, where they basically gave them the same amount of calories and simply giving it to them throughout the entire day versus packing it into kind of this feeding window. And uh, the animal that was uh, essentially doing intermittent fasting had 20%, 25%, whatever it was, longer uh, lifespan. And the whole idea going back to uh, being like the calories were the same. What you're talking about is like, well, imagine if then you swapped out like good calories and bad calories, even though the number is the same, it actually has a different impact on uh, on your body as well. And so I know that you're a heart surgeon. Uh, I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions at any point if you're like, hey, I don't know, like just tap out. Um, But uh, I'm going to throw you some questions that I've heard other people talk about that they don't know the answers and I don't know the answers either. First being, hey, I grew up in a household and uh, I was a kid. I just ate what my parents told me to eat. Uh, They didn't know any of this stuff. Uh, Frankly, they didn't care about any of this stuff. They were worried about making money and going to work and and, uh, you know trying to live as happy of a life as we could. Can I reverse the errors of 10, 20, 30, 40 years by now starting to eat healthy. How do you look at, and and maybe in some of your patients you've seen, like, can food have a really negative effect and then just simply making the changes today, can that reverse some of the damage that's been done? Or is it more so just you can stop creating more damage moving forward? Yeah, so the great news is that this can be improved anytime. You know, there may be damage that we're not able to undo. You know, again, when I look at the people who, end up on my operating table, the people who I'm doing surgery on. Um, You know, even if they change what they eat, 
at that point, we're probably not going to be able to avoid the need for the surgery. But we can still improve them. We can still improve where they are. And we can prevent more future problems from occurring. Um, because what I tell people now about heart surgery, what I tell the patients that I operate on, is that the surgery that I'm doing isn't changing what led to you needing the surgery in the first place. It's not addressing that root cause. And again, this is a problem we see over and over in our healthcare system today. We give you the medicine, we do the surgery, we're not addressing the root cause. But if you start to address that root cause, you can undo some of the damage, you can prevent more damage from occurring, and you can make your life better. You can improve your health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at where I was seven, eight years ago before I started this, and I was pre-diabetic and I was morbidly obese. Um, thankfully, I didn't get to the point where I had, you know, heart disease. Um, but I would have been there, clearly, um, you know, and I have many Ev many lines of evidence that show me that, um, you know, my dad had heart surgery. My grandmother died of heart disease. Um, so I was clearly headed down that path. It, it, for those that don't understand, when you say heart disease, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, like what exactly is happening in the heart? It, it, it's not a heart attack. It's not like some of these things that people may be more familiar with. What exactly is heart disease? Yeah. So there are many forms of heart disease, but again, the most common form we talk about is what we call atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. buildup of plaque in the arteries on the heart. So we have to realize the heart is a muscle. And the heart is our most unique muscle because it never stops working mm -hmm. until it does. Mm -hmm. And that's a bad day. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so the heart is constantly pumping and it obviously has a lot of demand for oxygen, nutrients, needs a lot of blood flow to support that. And so when these plaques start to build up in the arteries of the heart and the blood flow to the muscle now gets decreased, it can it has a lot of problems and it can take a couple of different forms. It can lead to a heart attack. Mm -hmm. It can lead to what we call heart failure, where the muscle becomes too weak uh, to keep up with the pumping demands. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time when people refer to heart disease, this is the type of heart disease that we're talking about. How much of that is uh, food? How much of that is stress? And how much of that is, I'll call it vices, uh, drugs, alcohol, you know, whatever crazy things that, that they're doing. And uh, what made me think of this is uh, the vices. There's some people who are very well known, especially on the internet, uh, for doing all kinds of crazy stuff from drinking all the time, cocaine, whatever. And they've had heart attacks in their 30s and early 40s. And you're like, okay, well, that seems to be an outlier. Maybe there's some connection with the lifestyle. Uh, but then also you hear all the time, like, oh, that person had a heart attack and they were just super stressed out. Yep. And so I guess like, is it all three? Is it actually one of these things, but we as humans are dumb and we just like to assign blame to a bunch of different things? Like how, how do you as a heart surgeon look at it? Yeah, so um, it is all of those things and genetics also get thrown in a lot. Um, what's the breakdown between them? I don't think we have exact numbers, but I today will tell you that food is probably 90% of it. Really? It's a big part of it. Would you go as far as to say if you ate healthy and did, you know, cocaine and drank alcohol that like you'd be better off than if you ate super unhealthy and didn't do that stuff? Yeah, I probably wouldn't go okay. quite that <laughs> far, but I would say if you eat healthy, um, and again, what does healthy mean to me? It means eating whole real food. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're probably going to be just fine. You know, when we look mm -hmm. at the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. it's clearly the 80% and maybe more is food. Um, you know, it's always interesting because people tend to think of, you know, the genetics as a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, my dad had heart disease. My grandfather has heart disease. You know, I have heart disease. It must be genetic. But the reality is that much of that is the habits that get passed down within the family. So, you know, like I said, my grandmother had heart disease. Mm -hmm. My father has heart disease. Mm -hmm. I don't have heart disease. Mm -hmm. Do I have different genetics? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but I've changed these habits that got passed down, you know, from my grandmother to my father uh, to me. And I clearly was on my way to developing heart disease, um, but I was able to change my habits and avoid that. So, uh, you know, what the message I try and get across to people is that genetics 
do play some role, but they're very small. It's mostly our habits, Mm -hmm. and our habits are what we eat, first and foremost. And then the other stuff you mentioned, stress certainly plays a role in it. Sleep plays a role in it. How much activity you get plays a role in it. And then there are other toxins um, is the way that I like to think about it besides the food that we are eating. Um, And these can be things like drugs. Uh, This can be some of the pollution, you know, some of the things in our environment uh, that also clearly contribute to heart disease. Um, But the major cause of the heart disease epidemic that we are seeing today, that we have been seeing for the past 70 years in this country, is coming from the food that we are eating. When we see the food pyramid, when we hear the food industry, when we are teaching our kids in schools uh, what to eat and what not to eat, if you eat too much red meat, you will get heart disease. Uh, You are a heart surgeon, and you're saying the exact opposite. Yep. And the science says the exact opposite. Okay, what's the disagreement here between uh, too much red meat equals heart disease, whereas you're saying, like, no, actually, too much of the other bullshit is causing the heart disease and, like, you should actually be eating more of this kind of nutrient-dense meat? Yeah, so, you know, this starts to get into uh, different types of scientific studies. Um, And without getting too deep in the weeds, uh, you know, one of the major types of scientific studies that are used when it comes to nutrition is what we call epidemiology. Okay. So you track how people eat. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this is self-reported and it's inaccurate. But if, putting that aside for a moment, um, we track what people eat and then we try and correlate to their health outcomes. But the problem is, you know, when you ask someone, you know, how much meat you eat and they give you an answer, a lot of that you know, we don't eat meat in isolation. Most of us are not eating only red meat, uh, although me and a lot of my friends now are eating mostly only red meat. But when someone says they ate a hamburger, what does that mean? Well, it means they had the meat that made up the hamburger, but most of the time it also means they had the bun, they had the ketchup, they had the toppings, they had the French fries that they had with their hamburger, and they drank the Coke, you know, with their hamburger as well. So you look at all that and you put it together and you start to analyze it and you say, oh, look, they ate more red meat. They got more heart disease. It must be the meat that's causing it. But again, maybe it was the Coke. Maybe it was the French fries. Maybe it's the bun. And, you know, when you really isolate out red meat, um, you cannot find a relationship with heart disease or cancer, by the way, which is another one that gets put forward or any of these ill health effects. Um, And we can look at this in a number of different ways. But, you know, one of the ways that I think is most relevant to look at it is let's think evolutionarily. You know, what have we been eating for the vast majority of our existence as human beings? We have been eating meat. Mm -hmm. What haven't we been eating for the vast majority of our existence as human beings? The processed food, Mm -hmm. the fake oils, the, you know, the highly processed carbohydrates. Um, So when we see these diseases that all of a sudden have become a problem, again, at a high level, you have to sit back and you have to think, you know, what's more likely to be causing this problem? You mentioned oil, uh, hot yep. topic yep. In, yep. Uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, there's the like canola oils. There's the extra virgin olive oils. There's no oil. There's everything in between. What are the good ones? And what are the ones that you're like literally avoid at all costs? And, and those are going to, you know, essentially just kill you. Yeah. So again, this is where um, it really starts to become ironic because one of the things I tell people is if it is a bottle of oil and it has a heart healthy label on it, it is not heart healthy. Oh, God. <laughs> these are your vegetable oils. These are your canola oils. All of these highly processed seed oils, as they're called, um, are not healthy. Um, Again, these are things that have been introduced into our food supply only within the past 100 to 150 years. We actually have very good scientific studies. So I mentioned before epidemiologic studies, um, which are not very good. Um, They can't show causation. Um, But there are also things called interventional studies uh, that can show causation. And we have a number of interventional studies looking at vegetable and seed oils that show 
that they shorten, they have higher mortality, um, and they don't lower the incidence of heart disease. Wow. Um, what they are promoted to do, they do not do. Uh, so again, it's the same thing around, you know, the meta concept. Eat whole real food um, that's been minimally processed. Um, eat the foods that we have been eating for millions of years. Uh, stay away from these new foods that have been introduced. So what does that look like when it comes to fats and oils? Mm -hmm. It looks like animal products. Uh, so these are going to be your animal fats, things like tallow and beef. Uh, these are going to be your butter, you know, your cream, your, uh, again, animal-derived uh, animal, animal derived fats. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to uh, look for uh, what are called fruit oils instead of seed oils. So fruit oils, which are your olive oil, your coconut oil, your avocado oil, they come from the actual fruit mm -hmm. as opposed to the seed, takes a lot less to extract them. They don't get processed and they seem to be less damaging uh, than the uh, highly processed and, and seed oils. And that's the oils. problem with the seed oil is not so much where it came from as much as the process to actually extract it is a heavy processing and therefore whatever is injected and treated and all of that getting into your body is essentially just toxins to the body and, and causing a lot of the issues? Yeah, so it's um, it's the industrial process that goes into extracting it and whatever that introduces into it. And it's also how the um, ratios of the types of fats that are then changed by that processing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we have... Um, um, basically, you know, when we look at fats in our uh, diet, um, they are broken into broad categories, saturated fat and unsaturated fats. And the unsaturated fats are then further differentiated between monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. And the more unsaturated a fat becomes, the more unstable it becomes. So it's prone to being damaged oxidized specifically. And these damaged fats, these are what ultimately leads to the problems in our body. Um, and so when you look at these vegetable and seed oils, um, as they become more processed, mm -hmm. they become more unsaturated, mm -hmm. and they therefore become more prone to damage. Mm -hmm. uh, simple sort of thought exercise for people about this is, you know, that bottle of canola oil, labeled heart healthy, and you leave it out on your counter with the cap open for like two days, what's going to happen to it? It becomes rancid. It smells horrible. It changes color. You know, we know instinctually, stay away from it. Don't eat it. Mm -hmm. Now go back and think about your grandmother, your great grandmother, and they uh, very likely had the bottle of uh, bacon grease <laughs> that would sit out on the counter for months at a time, and it was just fine. And they would cook with it, and we would eat it, and, you know, no issues. Uh, bacon grease, you know, lard, pig fat, um, at that time, very saturated, no mm -hmm. problems. Coconut oil, uh, again, a fruit oil uh, has basically the highest concentration of saturated fat of almost any uh, oil that we eat. Um, you can leave it out on the counter. It's never going to go bad, essentially. Uh, and this oxidation process that happens to the vegetable oil sitting on your countertop also happens within our bodies. And that's where the damage really starts to yeah. occur. Well, uh, speaking of coconut oil, one of the things somebody sent me one time, pe people send me weird food <laughs> things because I know that I like uh, find this stuff uh, fascinating. Um was that you can actually uh, take coconut oil, swish it around in your mouth, and then spit it out, and it'll help like clean your teeth. It's like actually one of like a, a yeah. natural like teeth pulling. It's process. called yep, oil pulling. Yeah, and, and I, I remember just being like, "Who figured that out?" Right? Like, so who was sitting there like, "What can I put in my mouth and see if it'll clean my teeth or not?" But like, there are these things that we I think realize you're probably not going to get that type of reaction and process out of something that is really bad for you. Right. It, it, it seems pretty clear that uh, in that process, it is able to uh, provide a benefit to the body. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it isn't chemicals and the kind of all this craziness that you're putting into your body. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think a lot of this, it turns out, is instinctual. You know, mm -hmm. again, when you go back, 
you know, th sort of through the evolutionary uh, record and you see the things that we ate naturally mm -hmm. uh, and we figured it out as humans. Um, and again, we've gotten into this environment, uh, this modern environment where the information around food has become so jumbled, so garbled, uh, that now everyone's like, what do I eat? Mm -hmm. It's like, we never really had a problem figuring out what to eat in the past. Mm -hmm. It's only now that we do. Um, and, I, you know, I do think that that is sort of intentional on many levels. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, if you're a food company, and you're trying to sell this processed food, uh, that's highly profitable, but clearly not good for our health, you just try and confuse everyone as much as possible. And they sort of throw their hands up and they said, okay, I guess I'll just eat whatever is convenient. And that's what's convenient. And uh, you have success. So, you know, when I'm working with people now, and I'm trying to get them to understand how to be healthy, one of the first steps is that intentionality about what you're eating. Um, instead of just grabbing whatever is most convenient, think about, you know, is this food supporting my health or not? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we just ask that question more, I think we would end up in a better place. So dinner, lunch, if you want to eat breakfast, whatever, uh, nutritionally dense food tends to be meat. Uh, we've talked a lot about red meat. What about like things like chicken or, or other types of meat that maybe aren't just steak or, or uh, hamburgers or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, one of the other issues we get into is, you know, when you start to think about the types of meat that you're going to eat, mm -hmm. you have to start thinking about what that animal was fed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know, you know, Texas Slim uh, certainly got into this conversation with you. Uh, but, you know, uh, ruminant animals. So these are animals that have multiple stomachs. Uh, these are, you know, beef is the most common thing, but, uh, you know, many of the uh, red meats that we eat, uh, these are all ruminant animals. And one of the magic things that ruminant animals can do is that they can process these grains, process what they're eating, um, and minimize the damage from it. So they turn a lot of the unsaturated fats that they are fed back into saturated fat. Um, humans can't do that. Non-ruminant animals can't do that. So chickens, pigs, these are not ruminant animals. And so the problem with pork, the problem with chicken oftentimes these days is that if those animals are fed very lousy diets, which mm -hmm. they oftentimes are, it's going to have more effects in their meat. So that's why red meat is probably the healthiest thing to eat. Now, is chicken better than the box of Oreos? Mm -hmm. Clearly it is. Uh, so again, I tell people at a high level, you know, eat real food, make that, you know, kind of the, the, the first rule, 80-20 mm -hmm. um, principle, eat real food first, and then if you want to really get into the weeds, um, yeah, most red meat is going to be healthier than most non-red meat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sourcing your food well, mm -hmm. uh, connecting with a local rancher in an ideal world and knowing what that food that you're eating, what it was eating, mm -hmm. um, is going to be uh, uh, more beneficial. So doing this at home, pretty self-explanatory, go get the meat, cook it, don't put crazy shit on it, whatever. When you go to a restaurant, there's a little bit of a black box. Like you order something on the menu, it comes out, it looks good. <laughs> you don't really know what happened back there. Is there anything that you do when you go to a restaurant to ensure that you're at least increasing the probability that you're eating healthy, even if you're just ordering a steak? Um, you know, a lot of it just starts with just eating the steak, you know, because I can tell, yeah, you know, is there a chance that they threw some vegetable oil on the grill with it? Yeah, there's a chance of that. That's probably going to have minimal effect. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm just eating the steak, I know I'm eating the steak. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're eating things that are, you know, have a lot of sauces in them, you don't know what's in the sauce. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, the side dishes, things like that, you can, you know, 
it, it can lead to more problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I try and keep it pretty simple when I go out to eat. You know, most of the time when I go out to eat, it's going to be a steak. It's going to be a burger without the bun, without the toppings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be a piece of fish or something like that, that I can have at least a pretty good idea mm-hmm. of what uh, went into that. 80-20. Um, 80-20 rule again. Um, but, you know, again, on the big picture, the less you eat out, probably the healthier you're going to be. You know, yeah. if we got better connected with our food, if we prepare our food, if we know what goes into it, uh, that's going to lead us to a better place than if we're outsourcing that to someone else. Yeah. Airports. I've seen you tweet about this before. Yeah. There's no good food in an airport. And this is coming from somebody in 2019, took 120 flights. Yep. I lived in airports. I ate in airports every single day. It was horrendous. Uh, I got to the point where I would like uh, go and get like a cliff bar. And I was like, well, I guess this is maybe sort of possibly the most healthy thing I could get here. Um, now I'm a little bit more intentional if I'm ever in an airport in terms of going and sitting at the restaurant and, and have enough time and all that. Are there any tips or tricks when people are in airports or traveling a lot that they should kind of adhere to? Maybe it's just not eat at the airport. I don't know. Yeah. Well, so yeah, travel becomes a great uh, time to uh, fast, uh, to do the intermittent fasting. Have um, you ever had Auntie Anne's though? You smell it from oh, yeah. all the way down the terminal. Oh, you're like, oh, I got to go stop. There. Again, they're manipulating you. Um, but yeah, I travel a lot too, you know, so uh, my heart surgery work these days is all travel. You know, I'm on airplanes, uh, you know, three weeks a month, I'm flying back and forth uh, for the most part. So I travel a lot. Uh, so fasting is is probably my best rule. Um, but really, you know, go to any of the burger places and order a couple of burger patties without the bun, without the toppings, you'll be all right. Mm-hmm. Is it the highest quality meat? No, it's not. But again, it's still going to be better uh, than the alternatives. Or if you have the time to sit down at the restaurant and order the steak or, you know, some grilled shrimp or a grilled piece of fish, something simple like that. Uh, those are my uh, go to's. Um, and then, you know, what can you bring with you? You know, things like uh, a beef jerky, you know, that's made without you know, too much sugar, uh, biltong, uh, which is a South African uh, type of uh, beef jerky, essentially, that's cleaner, uh, great thing to, you know, throw in your bag, uh, mm-hmm. some nuts, uh, you know, things like this uh, that you can take with you or another uh, great, but it, it comes again back to that intentionality, back mm-hmm. to that sort of thinking about it, planning about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, can you eat before you get to the airport? Can you eat after you get to, you know, after you get to wherever you're going? Uh, These are uh, some of the things I think about. But it is interesting, you know, the airport as a sort of microcosm of our environment Mm -hmm. uh, and then being on the airplane and you're just like, you know. (laughs) Do you see the article recently that says when you're in the air, your uh, taste buds, they change and therefore part of the airplane menu Uh, They try to uh, create a menu that when you're on the airplane in the air, it will actually be things that you think taste well. So uh, I think they said um, tomato juice, I think. Like a lot of people like – I think it was tomato juice. Uh, For whatever reason, it – uh, the amount that is ordered on the airplane is way outpacing in a normal restaurant or anything. And it has something to do with the changes physiologically while uh, while you're in the air. I haven't seen that article, but I mean, interesting to think about. Um, and, and so, like, do you eat on the airplane or are you just like, I'm staying away from anything that they possibly could give me while uh, 30,000 feet in the air? Yeah, it's pretty rare that I'm going to be eating on an airplane, you know, a, a pretty long, you know, overseas trip. I might, uh, you know, try and uh, pick out, you know, mm-hmm. pick away, you know, they bring you the whole plate and uh you know and also you know i'm not going to sit here and tell you i'm perfect i'm not going to tell you i sit you know i never eat processed food uh i'm human uh but again 80 20 rule and think about where you are and what your goals are this is another key concept around this Mm -hmm. you know if you are very unhealthy Mm -hmm. which unfortunately most of us are Mm -hmm. but if you're very unhealthy uh and you're trying to get healthy you know, that's going to look different than if you're healthy and you're active, mm-hmm. um, you know, then, yeah, you do have some tolerance for some of this stuff. You know, again, most of this stuff isn't acutely poisonous to us. It's not going to kill you right away. And in small amounts, 
every once in a while, it's probably going to be fine. Uh, so, you know, once or twice a month when I'm out with my family and I'm out with my kids and yeah, I have dessert at the restaurant, um, you know, and, uh, but uh, canceled. <laughs> it's not every night, you know? Yeah. And uh, again, I'm, I, you know, the other 95% of the time uh, I am eating just whole real food. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I've gotten healthy, you know, again, a lot different than, you know, eight years ago when I was morbidly obese and I was pre-diabetic. Uh, so you have to, you know, you take all of that into account. You mentioned sleep earlier. Um, and it's something that over the last two years I've gotten obsessive about. I used to six hours, maybe, um, and I just thought that's how like everyone lived, right? Was you're kind of, let me get some coffee and, and move through it. Now I sleep eight hours almost religiously every single night, sometimes a little bit more. Um, and if I ever have to sleep six, cause I misjudge time or I got to get up early to do something, whatever. Um, I feel horrible. Like I'm like, I cannot believe that I lived life this way. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing that I notice horrible uh, emotional regulation, right? It just, I, I'm irritable. I'm like all the things that, that people associate with uh, lack of sleep. Second thing is I eat horribly. Yeah. I eat different types of food and I eat way more uh, as well. How, what, what's the science behind that? Is, or is that just me like in my own head and I'm like, oh, I, I only slept six hours. So let me go eat like a pig and blame it on the sleep. This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the Eight Sleep Pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. No, we do have uh, some pretty good science, you know, that reinforces that. So sleep is essential to our health. Um, you know, what I tell people is, again, two things to consider in terms of your sleep, um, similar to food. It's the amount that you're sleeping, but it's also the quali quality of your sleep. Uh, so, you know, six hours of good, high-quality sleep can oftentimes be better than eight hours of poor quality sleep. Mm. Uh, so, you know, this is where you want to start paying attention to the things that are affecting the quality of your sleep. Um, the foods that we eat affects the quality of our sleep. You know, that relationship between food and sleep works both ways. Because uh, when we eat lousy food, we sleep worse. And when we sleep worse, we get hungrier, we get more irritable, we want to eat more of the lousy food that, you know, kind of makes us um, maybe feel a little better in the short term, um, but uh, clear relationship there. So, you know, again, what are the high level concepts? What you eat is most important, but then the other things that come into play, sleep is probably the next biggest one. Mm -hmm. I'm an investor in a company, uh, Eight Sleep. They've had the mm -hmm. uh, thermoregulated mattress. And uh, um, although I, I love the team, I love the product, all the stuff, the, one of the most valuable pieces of the product to me is I get a notification every day. And it's almost like a lottery, right? Yeah. <laughs> like a uh, notification will say, uh, uh, have less energy today. Don't be surprised. Like your heart rate was 6% higher last night than average. Or like this morning, your heart rate uh, was 10% lower than on average. Like, that's why you have so much energy. And I like ask myself, I'm like, do I feel like I have more or less energy? And maybe it's 80, 90% of the time, I actually do feel like there's some variability to it. And of course, the uh, implicit thing is that it's the product itself, right? And, and kind yeah. of I sleep with it ice cold. So like that should be helping me. Uh, but how much of that actual like heart performance in your sleep has an impact on some of this stuff. Like if you can drive that resting heart rate while you're sleeping down, uh, whether it's through a product like Eat Sleep, it's exercise, food, whatever, like is that actually really, really important? Um, yeah, so uh, specifically uh, what we're talking about there is what's called heart rate variability, mm -hmm. HRV, um, and it does seem to have a impact on uh, recovery and on performance. Um, you know, I do always question, you know, how much of this is, uh, you know, sort of the 
placebo effect, the psychologic effect that you see that number and you're like, oh, today's going to be a great day. <laughs> or you see that number and you're like, today's not going to be such a great day. Um, but, you know, we do see correlates. So uh, for a lot of people, one of the things, um, you know, that I that uh, they'll notice around HRV and sleep is if you, you know, don't drink alcohol for a period of time, your HRV tends to get better. Um, or at least you don't drink it too close to going to sleep, your HRV is going to get better. Um, you know, uh, people uh, who, you know, I'll notice it in myself, you know, that once or twice a month that I do have the dessert when we're out to dinner, and then I go home, and I'm like, I didn't sleep so good that night, you know. Uh, and HRV is one of the ways to, uh, to uh, measure that. I'm going to tell you a crazy story. This is not an experience I had, uh, but I have a friend who will go unnamed, uh, was in Las Vegas, um, and uh, he was at the club. And according to the way he told me the stories, he saw Tiger Woods at the club, and he was having a freaking blast. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was going back to his hotel room, and he just happened to go by the gym. Right. And he saw Tiger Woods running on the treadmill at like 3 34 o'clock in the morning. And so he was just like, whatever. And this guy's in the sports world. Right. And so he, he uh, goes into the gym and he's basically like, uh, hey, man, like, what, are you, what are you doing? I saw you drinking. It's four o'clock in the morning. And uh, the way he tells the story is that Tiger basically was like, if you sweat it out before you go to sleep, it doesn't count. What possible science is there behind uh, – you mentioned not drinking right before you go to sleep. Uh, is there anything around uh, the effect on your heart or on your sleep of like actually sweating out alcohol before – uh, you go to bed? I, you know, there probably is something to processing the alcohol okay. in some way. Uh, so, you know, alcohol is a toxin to mm -hmm. our bodies. It's interesting, you know, uh, when we think about, uh, you know, where we get energy from, mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone thinks about carbohydrates and they think about dietary fat. Um, and, you know, what they don't oftentimes account for is, you know, alcohol is uh, another energy source for our body. Uh, but alcohol is toxic to our bodies. So if there's alcohol in the system, the body's going to do everything it can to get rid of that alcohol first and foremost. Uh, and it's going to stop processing the things down the line. So, you know, the sugar that so many of us take with our alcohol, mm -hmm. you know, it basically ends up hanging out in our bodies longer while mm -hmm. our body's trying to get rid of that alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, so exercise, uh, sweating, uh, these are other ways of, you know, mm -hmm. processing this, of getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, so there probably is something to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I'm assuming this was Tiger in his younger days, and, yes. and he probably was able to handle it anyway, yeah. uh, being in such great shape. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you can do something to uh, get rid of that uh, alcohol, uh, whether it's exercise or go sit in the sauna or something like that, there probably yeah. is some validity to that. Now, again, does that mean that you should drink more alcohol because, oh, you can just go sit in the sauna? Doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> yeah. So as a heart surgeon, one of the things I, I've always uh, been fascinated by, especially specifically around the heart and I think like lifestyle, is uh, when I was in college, um, there was – uh, an absolute uh, explosion of energy drinks and then alcoholic energy drinks. And I remember um, uh, kind of watching these, you know, become popular. And at some point, some of them were forced to actually change the formula because it seemed like the amount of energy drink was actually masking how much alcohol was being delivered and kids were dying. And mm -hmm. it got pretty gruesome. Uh how much impact does, I guess, caffeine, these energy drinks, et cetera, have on the heart? And like, how bad are they for you, right? If somebody goes and grabs a Monster or a Red Bull and they drink one a week versus if you're drinking one a day, like, is that any different than drinking coffee? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, I do think there are some uh, uniquely, um, you know, damaging effects from uh, these products. And, and, you know, it's probably the concentrated caffeine with the sugar okay. uh, that is in most of these energy drinks as well. Uh, so, you know, coffee is one of these interesting um, uh, things that, you know, it, the science is always flipping on, you know, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you. Uh, coffee and eggs, I think, are the two most common things that, you know, you get every week, there's a new study coming out. In the end, um, I don't think that there's anything too damaging about drinking coffee. Um, I don't think it's the caffeine itself that's necessarily a problem. Uh, but when you start to combine caffeine, 
sugar um, in these high amounts, in these concentrated amounts, not great for you. Um, you know, so we talk about processed food. Um, we also have to think about processed drink. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to think about, you know, um, one of the other big rules, you know, that I and many others give for people who are trying to improve their health is don't drink calories. Um, there's really no need to drink calories. Uh, and there's, you know, the, the forms that the calories we can drink come in uh, are usually going to be from sugar. They're going to be from processed food. So, you know, probably uh, something that we should avoid uh, for the most part is uh, drinking calories. Uh, but yeah, there clearly was um, an association between these energy drinks uh, and, uh, you know, negative uh, effects on the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not not something that I recommend. Yeah. What about protein shakes? We mentioned earlier high protein diet obviously gets yeah. leads to metabolism and, and kind of all these things. Uh, but it's a synthetic form, right? It's a powder that ends up getting kind of add water and supposed to deliver all this protein. Yeah. It, I'm assuming it's not as good as steak, but is it like the next best thing or should people avoid these? Yeah. You know, I think again, uh, they probably – if they're a limited part, they shouldn't be your primary source of protein ultimately. Uh, and ultimately, you're always going to be better getting it as whole real food. Mm -hmm. But, you know, real life happens and mm -hmm. convenience and, uh, you know, sometimes it's just not feasible to get enough protein or, you know, to have it in forms that are available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tell people, if you're going to use protein shakes, you know, try and make sure they are as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend animal derived proteins, mm -hmm. uh, I think are better absorbed, provide a better amino acid profile than the plant proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I try and look for a nice, clean whey protein shake. Um, and uh, again, keep it as simple as possible. You know, mm -hmm. if you're taking that protein, protein powder. One of the big mistakes I see, this oftentimes will be at the gym. People go and they do their workout and then they go to the smoothie bar mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, well, there's protein powder in my smoothie, so it must be healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but meanwhile, it's sugar and, you know, all this other processed stuff that's going into that smoothie. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, is the protein powder itself damaging? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the other stuff you've now put into that smoothie um, is you know, going to be undoing a lot of the, uh, you know, benefits that you've gotten from the time at the yeah, gym. It's so fascinating. It, it's, it's an area that I tell people you should be cautious about. And again, be intentional, mm -hmm. find the best, you know, cleanest, simplest protein powder you can get. And then, you know, make the smoothie yourself with, you know, like my go-to is going to be whole milk, a little bit of protein powder. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that, that's, really all you need. Uh, and that protein shake is going to be better than the pre-packaged, pre-made protein shake that has like 12 different ingredients in it uh, that you can't pronounce. So you mentioned milk. Uh, growing up, I'm pretty sure we just drank 2% milk. Like mm -hmm. That was just what we got uh, uh, was in the refrigerator. Uh, you kind of get used to it. And so yep. all of a sudden whole milk or something else tastes like a little off, right? Um Whole milk, obviously, I think has uh, had a resurgence maybe. Like people are like more excited about it. Then there's raw milk, which is like a whole nother thing. How do you look at these milks and like what's good for you, what's not good for you? If you're just drinking milk, is that like 80-20 and hey, milk is better than no milk or, or what do you think? Yeah, so, um, you know, so whole milk is my typical recommendation. Um, anything that's other than whole milk, again, is going to be more processed. So 2% mm -hmm. milk, skim milk, what have they done? They've taken the fat out and they've replaced it with sugar, carbohydrates. Uh, so uh, if you're going to drink milk, I recommend whole milk. Um, the raw milk thing, um, you know, may have some validity to it. So the um, pasteurization process, um, which again was originally promoted for food safety reasons, um, we see that it damages the proteins in that milk. Um, it changes them so our bodies can't process them as well. Um, there is a lot of debate about, you know, whether we should be drinking milk at all. You know, you look at all other mammals and once they are weaned, once they are in, you know, out of childhood, they basically stop drinking milk. Mm -hmm. um, is 
milk damaging to us. Hard to say, uh, you know, we get into all the issues with lactose intolerance. But again, a lot of that comes from the processing of the milk. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, the gut damage, um, you know, the intestinal damage that so many of us have because of the food that we have been eating that then allow these milk proteins to get across the barrier in our gut that they don't normally get across. Um, and so we say we're intolerant to the milk, but it turns out that we just have gut damage from the lousy food that we're eating. So mm-hmm. I have worked with a number of people who, you know, I'm lactose intolerant, they tell me. And, you know, we go through all the thing and we get their diet cleaned up and their gut heals and their overall health improves. And now they can start drinking milk again and they don't have the problems with it. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it, it oftentimes becomes hard to separate out, uh, you know, is it the milk itself or is it other things, you know, that have damaged our health that we are now no longer able to tolerate this. Um, the, this leads to like the the kumbacha and like, all, I, I'm going to mispronounce every single yeah. word because it's like kind of woo woo science yeah. to me, but it leads to gut health and like, yeah. oh, we could do all this other stuff. Yeah. Which kind of feels like maybe you're hinting at that, like what you're eating ruins something in your gut and now you're going to take something else to try to cure what is could just be cured by eating healthy food? Is exactly, that? yeah. Okay. That's, you know, gut health is probably a whole nother topic that we yeah. can spend another three hours on. But yeah, a lot of that comes down to exactly that. You know, why are our guts unhealthy? It's because of the food that we are eating. Mm. And when you get back to eating whole real food and the gut heals, and all of a sudden, a lot of these gut problems get better. You know, again, I've now worked with a number of people um, and, uh, you know, I've had, uh, you know, contact with a lot more people Mm -hmm. and they had all of these gut problems, um, irritable bowel disease, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that got fixed when they change the food that they are eating mm. and all the medications that they were given. And a lot of these people end up, unfortunately, needing surgery and things like that. And most of it can be tracked down, tracked back to the food that they ate. One of your most interesting ideas, uh, which I know nothing about, is the connection between metabolic health and uh, mental health. And when I saw you tweeting about this, I was like, man, I don't think I've really heard that many people talk about that because usually the mental health thing is like, uh, uh, I call it like the thoughts and prayer strategy, like, oh, my word should help you. Or there is a strategy around, uh, let's just give you like pharmaceutical medicine. Explain more as to the connection between metabolic health and mental health and like why you think that if you fix your metabolic health, that may actually help on some of this other stuff. Yeah. And this is something that has been most fascinating to me as well, because, you know, as a heart surgeon, I didn't think a lot about mental health. Um, And then as you get into this metabolic health thing, and uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Christopher Palmer, he's a uh, psychiatrist who um, has now published extensively on this, um, has a uh, upcoming book, um, and, uh, you know, is probably one of the leaders in this area. And he has shown clear relationships between our metabolic health and our mental health, and that a lot of our mental health issues probably stems from inflammation in the brain. And, you know, just like we get the inflammation in our gut from eating these uh, processed foods, these unhealthy foods, we get inflammation in our brain. Uh, And he has extensive experience with pretty advanced mental health disorders, things like schizophrenia, um, that he routinely now, and he's been doing this for 20 years, uh, he routinely sees improvements in these serious mental health conditions just by changing the food that people are eating. Wow. Yeah, mind-blowing stuff. And not even necessarily exercise. I'm sure exercise gets laid in as well, but but just food alone exactly. could improve the metabolic health, which then could have an impact on the mental health. Yep, just changing the food that we eat. Wow. Uh, and there are many different reasons that that can be tr- that may be true, you know, at, at uh, the physiologic level, you know, inflammation in the brain, um, the fuel that your brain is running on, the fuel that your body is running on. One of the other major sort of shifts that we see on a metabolic level when we stop eating processed food, when we eat less carbohydrates, is our bodies start relying more on fat for energy. 
ketogenesis, the ketogenic diet that we've all heard so much about. Um, what that means at a physiologic level is that the primary fuel source that our body is using shifts from sugars to fats, essentially. And this has a lot of unique effects. Uh, and it turns out that two of the organs that it probably has the most effect on are our brains and our heart. Um, so uh, when you shift your body towards a ketogenic metabolism um, in the brain, and the brain starts using more ketones for energy than sugar for energy, uh, a lot of good things happen. Uh, and again, this is probably our baseline. This is how we were meant to function. And um, getting back to that can fix a lot of these mental health problems that we see. Do you have patients like measure, are they in ketosis or not, or, or uh, anything like, like, I, I guess, like, how serious or obsessed do you want them to be about actually getting to like that ketosis, you know, kind of uh, environment versus, hey, just do the 80-20 and like, do enough to kind of be headed in that direction? Yeah, so again, it depends on, you know, where you're coming from and what your goals are. Uh, there are certain conditions that you do need to maintain pretty strict ketosis. And so I will have people measure. Um, if it's just a general health thing, probably not as necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, you know, as you get used to it, you know, the information maybe doesn't become as useful anymore. When you're first trying to do these things, getting that feedback, are you in ketosis, can be useful. Uh, and so sometimes I will have people measure it, but oftentimes I don't. Uh, when you start to look at some of these feedback tools that we can get, some of these things that we can measure, um, probably the most useful thing, um, and again, hot topic that many people are hearing about, continuous glucose monitoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see, uh, you know, many people who wear continuous glucose monitors. Uh, that is actually something that I think can be very useful. Um, and again, it's going to depend on where you're starting from, what you're trying to achieve. You know, do you need it all the time? For most people, probably not. Uh, but at the beginning of your journey, I find it to be very useful with patients because, you know, when we get back to, again, the foods that we're eating, and we oftentimes don't have something that we can immediately get that feedback. You know, you eat the food, you might not feel bad right away. It's only over many months and years that these things start to build up. Uh, but our blood sugar level is something that we can measure. And we now have very good tools, continuous glucose monitors, mm -hmm. that we can see it immediately. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you eat the food and your blood sugar is shooting up, uh, that is a problem. And it's a problem maybe with your underlying state of health. And it also may be a problem with the food. So uh, continuous glucose monitors, um, I recommend them often. I use them often with my patients. Uh, ketone measurements, again, can be useful. Uh, we don't have a continuous ketone uh, monitor, mm -hmm. would probably be useful. Uh, continuous insulin monitoring would probably be one of the most useful things we can find figure out, but we don't have it available. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but intermittently measuring insulin is another thing that I do uh, with my patients as well. Uh, I've got a friend, uh, Jeff Wu, who uh, started a company HVMN, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they recently uh, were able to get their hands on some IP from uh, DARPA and the U.S. government uh, about 15, 20 years ago. What they saw was uh, they ran some tests on if we gave people ketones, could we get them to a state of ketosis yep. uh, on a faster basis? And the idea was basically, can we take our war fighters that are out on the battlefield, give them a drink essentially, and if that works, then like this would be amazing. Uh, he has been able to commercialize it. Uh, I think it's called Ketone IQ. Uh, he's given it to me. I've used it. Something's going on, right? <laughs> when I drink it, something happens. Yeah. I'm not a scientist, but like, I, as I told him, we, we recorded a conversation, but I said, I think I'm high, <laughs> right? Like, like yep. you just have this like mental clarity or whatever. How do you think about the potential for external things, whether they're pills, drinks, you know, whatever it is, uh, to help the patients versus you're just focused on like, this is all about the food. And if you get the food right, then like you might not even need some of this other stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my default is, you know, can we do this 
sort of, I guess you would say, naturally, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we achieve this just by, you know, the food that we're eating, avoiding certain toxins? Um, and if we can't, you know, then things like supplements um, may become useful. Uh, and there are a number of reasons that that might occur. Mm-hmm. And there are also uh, certain conditions, um, you know, that maybe – damage has been done that's, you know, already advanced, Mm -hmm. and we can't undo it all by changing what we eat. And supplements, you know, again, uh, may become useful. So, you know, when you look at uh, things like ketone uh, supplements of uh, any sort, um, probably the two areas where we have the most data showing their usefulness, um, Alzheimer's disease, Mm -hmm. um, and again, the unique effects of ketones on the brain, uh, and heart failure, the unique effects of ketones on the heart. Uh, So there have been some early scientific studies, some animal data, uh, that in these two conditions in particular, ketone supplementation might be useful. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if we could accomplish high levels of ketosis, therapeutic therapeutic ketosis just by changing the food that we eat, probably better. And in most cases, we can. But in other situations, you know, I do see some usefulness for yeah. that. It, it, it's crazy how important that uh, kind of end state of ketosis ends up being for the, for the body. Um, another topic I thought would be interesting to talk uh, through is I'm in my mid-30s. Uh, I have uh, always been uh, interested in physical health, right? Uh, played sports, did all this stuff. But never from a pure data science standpoint or, or like uh, as I would consider like a nerd, you know, going mm-hmm. in and, and trying to accomplish this. Historically have been, uh, eh, I'll go to the doctor if something's wrong, but like, you know, what, what's the point? Um, and uh, when I got an Apple Watch, all of a sudden, oh, how many steps? They got the rings. Like they got all these little kind of data points. I was like that's interesting, but – didn't really change my behavior that much. And then I started to get more serious about it. I started worrying about sleep and, and here we go. The next like big leap, I think for me, who I would put myself in the category of, I'm not the the pure novice, but I'm still kind of amateur in, in terms of getting serious about your health and understanding some of this stuff is blood work. And it feels like the blood work, I got some friends who are real serious and not going to get my blood work done every, you know, three months. Blah, blah, blah. Some people get it every week or, or whatever it is. And they're obsessed about it. When you first deal with a, cl- uh, a, a, a client or a patient, what do you have them go get to just establish the baseline? Like, is it, hey, go get this crazy study done that, you know, takes forever? Or is it like, no, I'm really just looking for like one or two data points and that tells me, you know, 80% what I need to know. How, how do you look at blood work and, and kind of a starting point or baseline? Yeah, so um, I would say my typical blood work recommendations are – more towards the basic side. Um, there are some advanced things that I'll typically look at with people. Uh, but really, you know, just starting baseline, if you want to know, you know, are you in good metabolic health, uh, the key blood test to look at. Um, first of all, you want to uh, look at your blood sugar level. Mm-hmm. And better than just looking at a spot blood sugar level um, is what's called a hemoglobin A1C. And this is a reflection of your average blood sugar over the past three months, essentially. Uh, So it's a little bit better than just looking at a spot, you know, one spot in time. Um, The cholesterol panel, it turns out, is important to look at, um, but not how most doctors look at it. When you get your cholesterol panel done, your most physicians look at one number on that panel, the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, and they're going to tell you this is the most important number when it comes to your health. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is it's not. <laughs> and again, a whole nother topic uh, that we can get into. But when I look at a cholesterol panel, I look at two other measurements on there the HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol level, as it's called, and the triglycerides. Uh, And you can look at the ratio between those two. Um, So the triglycerides divided by the HDL, and that's going to give you an indicator of your metabolic health. Specifically, Mm. it's going to give you an indicator of is your body sensitive to insulin? Uh, So insulin resistance, when your body becomes insensitive to the effects of insulin, is the primary physiologic derangement that occurs with poor metabolic health. Mm. Um, And that leads us to another very important measurement for basic blood work, which is check your insulin level. 
And again, most doctors don't do this. Uh, so I advise everyone get your fasting insulin level. So again, you should be about eight to 12 hours fasted when you do this and see what your insulin level is. Um, and can that be after sleep? Like if you ate yeah. at 8 p.m. and you wake up in the morning, then you can go ahead and just take it and that should be good enough? Correct, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's another important thing. Um, and, and honestly, if you just check those couple of things, you're going to get a pretty good sense of where you are in your health. Now, I end up doing a lot you know, probably some more advanced things. I end up, uh, you know, again, getting back to the cholesterol question. You can get into the advanced lipid panel where we look at the sizes of your cholesterol particles. Uh, those are also things that are important. But you really don't have to be doing these extensive blood panels for most people. Now, again, if you have specific problems that you're trying to address, they may become useful. Um, Another very important test, this gets outside of the blood work, uh, but probably um, when people come to me, specifically around heart health, mm -hmm. and they say, what test should I get to know if my heart is healthy? Mm -hmm. um, what I think is probably the best test to get and one of the most underutilized tests today is what's called a coronary artery calcium scan, a CAC scan. So this is a simple, uh, easy to do CAT scan. The test literally takes five minutes to do. Oh. They don't have to put an IV in you. Uh, it's a low dose of radiation. It's about the same uh, radiation you get from having a chest X-ray. And uh, it's typically pretty inexpensive. You can get it done for somewhere between $100 and $200. Insurance won't cover it in many cases. We can get into that whole discussion. But this will actually show you whether or not you are developing plaque specifically calcified plaques in the arteries of your heart. And this will show you, again, are you developing heart disease way before it becomes, you know, symptomatic to the point that you're having chest pains. Uh, which is this is, for older people normally? Um, you know, I typically will advise people in their 30s and 40s to mm. get a baseline test. Uh, because if you're already showing plaque and you're in your 30s, yeah. that's a very bad sign. Yep. Now, if you don't have plaque and you're in your 30s, what I tell people is, you know, it's not that much of a guarantee um, as opposed to if you're in your 70s and you have zero plaque, you have a zero CAC score, it's a pretty much guarantee that you're not going to die of heart disease. Um, so uh, I don't think it needs to be um, – reserved only for older people. I usually tell people, like I said, get a baseline test in your 30s or 40s, uh, especially if, you know, you have reason to think you're at risk for heart disease. If you're diabetic, if you're insulin resistant, um, if you're overweight, uh, then get the scan. Let's find out where you're starting from. Do you have heart disease already? And then can we stop the progression of that heart disease? And the answer in most cases is yes, we can with all the things that we've been talking about today. So you get these tests done and let's say that you come back uh, and you're not diabetic, you're not insulin resistant, but uh, you're not zero, whether it's the plaque or, or uh, some of the metrics are like, ah, yep. you know, you, you're higher than we'd like you to be. Yeah. Food seems to be the number one place. Hey, if we correct the diet. What about exercise? Like, are there certain types of exercises that go for a long run, lift heavy weights, go for a walk? Like, like how do you think about the exercise component? What's probably best for the heart? Yeah, so um, the two concepts I try and get people to understand around exercise. Number one is be more active. Uh, so that doesn't mean you need to go to the gym for an hour a day. It just means be more active. Uh, you know, walk around more during the day. Mm -hmm. Take that break. Take that 10-minute break. You know, if you're sitting at your desk all day, take a 10-minute break every hour and get up and do a few laps around the building. Mm -hmm. Take the stairs instead of the escalator or the elevator when you can. You know, park further away or walk the extra block uh, wherever you're going. Uh, use stand-up desks instead of sitting all day. Simple things like this are probably going to be more effective than if you go to the gym for the hour a day, you run on the treadmill, and then you just sit around the rest of the day. Mm. Um, when it comes to exercise, um, your priority, I believe, should be building and maintaining muscle. Again, we have very good scientific data showing that the better you're able to maintain muscle as you get older, 
not only the longer you live, but the better quality of life that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So build and maintain muscle. The other, the, you know, the other benefit of muscle is it really gives you more leeway mm -hmm. in terms of metabolic health. Mm -hmm. uh, the more muscle we have, the more metabolically healthy we are going to be. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to the gym, prioritize building muscle and then just try and get more activity throughout your day. Yeah. The, the building muscle, I think, is um, uh, such an easy one uh, to conceptualize, right, or to, to understand the concept. Um, doing it. I find a lot of people who uh, they're like, ah, what do you mean? Um, I don't want to be a, a bodybuilder, right? right? And it always cracks me up because <laughs> the people who usually say that, I just, yeah. I don't think you're going to have to be yeah. the one to no worry No one becomes about. a bodybuilder by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're the person who is likely to have that problem. Um, but it also does get at the, this very uh, interesting idea, which is um, we live these sedentary lives and uh, your idea of like, be more active, I think is kind of one key piece, but building muscle doesn't have to go, you know, go bench press, go do some yep. of this stuff. Like it can literally just be, if you've never exercised before and you start to exercise, like you will build muscles uh, or you will realize things uh, uh, are tough that you didn't otherwise realize. And remember in the military, uh, there would always be the person being, you know, a, a smart ass or whatever, especially like basic training. And they used to take a piece of paper and they'd say, oh yeah, you're a tough guy, okay. And they would hand them the piece of paper and they'd have them hold the, with two fingers on either side, they'd hold the paper out in front of them and they'd leave them there for like 30, 45 minutes, an hour or whatever. And they come back out and the person's like shaking, right? And they can't yeah. hold the paper. They're like, oh, I think so tough guy came and hold a piece of paper up, right? And so it's like those types of things, they build muscle a very different way, but like something as simple as like holding a piece of paper up in front of you for an hour can be incredibly difficult and a, a physically challenging th activity. And other people who could bench press the world can't do that. And it's yeah. kind of a crazy, you know, dichotomy. Yeah, no, and, and that's exactly it. When it comes to, you know, building muscle, you have to think about resistance, you know, exercise, resistant activities. And walking is a resistance activity, you know? And like you said, if you just do more walking, you're going to build muscle. Um, you know, body weight exercises can be very effective. So, you know, if someone's asking me where to start, I'll tell them, start by doing some some push-ups, some pull-ups, and some squats. If you do those three things and you do it, you know, you don't have to do it for a long time. You know, 15 minutes a day, four days a week can be more than enough. Uh, and, and, you know, there are a number of ways to do this. You know, I personally, again, we get back to travel a lot and okay, so you can't get to the gym. Um, you know, I use uh, the X3 system, um, which I'm sure many people have heard of, but it's basically just a resistance band and a bar and a plate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can do a 15 minute workout. And I do it, you know, four times a week. Uh, there, there are two sets of exercises. There's your push and your pulls. Mm -hmm. And you do it, you know, each one of them twice a week. And that's, that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are other people uh, that, I talk, uh, that I talk with. Uh, you know, there's a uh, Dr. Ben Bocciccio, um, who uh, his, um, you know, he has a very simple, you know, band and body weight mm -hmm. uh, program. Uh, um, you know, Jerry uh, Texera is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, again, simple body weight things can be very effective. Yeah. You don't have to spend all your life at the gym. And then as you alluded to, you know, no one becomes a bodybuilder by accident. <laughs> um, but really, you know, what does it take to build muscle? It takes eating protein and it takes doing some resistance exercise. Mm -hmm. And so if we just start shifting that direction, eat more protein, do more resistance exercise, you're going to end up in a better place than where you started. It, it, it's, um, it's simple, hard to execute. But it it's yeah, simple that's idea. exactly it. How, how can people interact with you? Like, like you, you have obviously uh, the heart surgery, you know, kind of component of your life. Uh, hopefully nobody's interacting yeah, with you no there. one wants to uh -huh. intentionally uh -huh. interact uh -huh. with me there. But you do a lot of other things that yeah. I think kind of prevent people from getting to that point. We'll explain a little bit more about kind of some of the stuff you're doing. Yeah, so my goal, um, you know, uh, for the past few years and moving forward is to keep as many people off of my operating table as possible. Uh, so, you know, along those lines, uh, I've tried and figure it, you know, trying to figure out how best to do that for as many people as possible. Uh, so first way I tell people, best way to interact with me um, is my book. It's called Stay Off My Operating Table. 
Um, and that's exactly what I want you to do. Widely available, all the usual places. Um, so uh, you can start there. Um, I have uh, a group coaching program um, that uh, I invite people to. Uh, you can go to ifixhearts.com and you can find all about the group coaching program. Uh, you can also find out there about some of the courses I offer, uh, you know, just a lot of the educational stuff. And then I do have a private telemedicine practice um, where I do work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I do this all via telemedicine. So I see people from throughout the United States. Uh, that information is at ovadiahearthealth.com, O-V-A-D-I-A, hearthealth.com. And you can find out about becoming a member of my practice there. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty incredible in the digital age how you can take uh, what used to be somewhat localized knowledge where that you could apply, and now you're able to uh, build uh, products that uh, can be consumed asynchronously uh, in a group setting or a one-on-one. -on -one. And, and uh, what excites me about it is like for the people with knowledge and information that can change people's lives, you can get that word out to so many more people. I mean, even the fact that you and I were able to connect on the internet, right, it yep. is something that wasn't possible 20 years ago, and now it, it just feels like uh, people who are looking and actually serious about changing their life and their health, they can do that now because the information's out there and access to the right people. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I know how much you talk about, you know, building things to change these problems that we have. You know, we're all aware of this problem, I think, around our health. So what can we start building to really change that? Mm -hmm. What are some of the big ideas that are going to lead us forward in health? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's another area that I work in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are other projects that I think about. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I'm currently uh, involved in a project that's conceptualizing, you know, how can your home help mm -hmm. you to remain healthy? Mm -hmm. You know, what does a healthy home do? really look like. Mm -hmm. And all of this data that we have around us around health, you know, we have our wearables, we can measure all these things about our environment. Um, what if your home was collecting all of that information? Mm -hmm. What if it was going to a healthcare team mm -hmm. that was proactively thinking about your health mm -hmm. and not about, you know, how do we take care of you when you're sick, but how do we keep you from getting sick? Yeah. Uh, so just thinking about, you know, big concepts like this and what we can do, again, just to normalize health. You yeah. know, over the past 50 years, we have normalized being unhealthy and we need to change it. We need to normalize health again. Let's make healthy great again. You know? <laughs> um, and let's think about, you know, how we can really bring health uh, back into the conversation. Yeah. And where can people follow you on Twitter? Uh, at Twitter, I'm on iFixHearts is my handle there. Pretty good one. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I was very lucky. So, you know, early days of Twitter, I got on. I'm like, I don't know what this Twitter thing is, but seems to be a good place to, you know, get some news. Uh, and uh, I grabbed iFixHearts um, as a heart surgeon. And uh, here I am 10 years later, and it's exploded, you know, for me, it's now the main way, you know, I probably interact with people. It's how you and I uh, started uh, interacting. Uh -huh. uh, and, um, but uh, grabbing iFix Hearts turned out to be one of those pretty fortuitous uh, things <laughs> all those years ago. I, I love it. And it, uh, it's very easy to understand what, what you do, right? Yep. Yep. It, there's no, uh, there's no secret, but listen, I, I learned a ton today. I, I really appreciate the time and uh, uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. And I think um, what, what's uh, so exciting and, and kind of fascinating is that uh, you have a very specific view of the world, but I think that you're sympathetic and understand that like humans are humans and you can't show up and be like, upend your whole life and change everything. And, and yeah. you're like, look, if you can, you know, do this one thing and, and, you know, oh, you drink five sodas. I know you said, hey, if you drink five sodas a week, maybe drink four, right? And kind of just slowly ease people in the right direction, uh, which seems like you yourself did as well. Uh, it's a pretty powerful concept is to, to not only have that strong view of the world, but also understand that, you know, it doesn't matter unless people actually uh, uh, kind of internalize it and, and act on it. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, you know, ultimately, uh, I try and get people to understand, you know, I've been there, I've been through the struggle. Uh, you know, I, I have all the challenges, you know, I lead the busy life and I have the work and the family and all of that. Uh, but it really doesn't take 
a whole lot of effort if you just understand these simple concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can be a very um, easy to integrate it into your life. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy to do, uh, but once you get educated, once you understand, um, you know, what is it that's damaging your health, um, it really is not um, that complex as to how to undo these things and mm -hmm. how to make yourself healthy again, how to take back your health. That is uh, uh, going to help somebody out there, which uh, which I appreciate you, your time, your effort, and uh, we'll be cheering for you. And hopefully we'll do this again in the future as you continue to make progress. Sounds good. Thanks, Anthony.